if every woman on the planet was actively working with the moon, if their intentional prayers were being set every month, I think we would fundamentally see a shift energetically. Pay attention to not just what you are doing to give your appreciation to nature, but how is nature speaking back to you? I dance to the ocean, I dance to the waves, I dance to the birds flying. It's like I call in my sacred appreciation to be her child. It's our way of adoring her. The Divine Mother knows how to handle chaos. And this chaos magic that can be inside, when it is taken into the womb of the Divine Mother, she's the one who looks and says, okay, what are my children needing? How can I bring healing to them? What the Divine Mother does is she attracts through her love, through her compassion, through being the essence of who she is. Welcome, Welcome home, home to, to the, the Loving, Loving Consciously, Consciously Podcast. Podcast. My name is Amaris. And my name is Eric. And if you are like us, nobody, nobody taught, taught you, you how, how to love. love. We are best friends and life partners here to vulnerably and authentically share our seven-year journey to unconditional love. Our mission is to help you learn how to love consciously in all of your relationships so we can journey together towards a more effective, intentional, and fulfilling way of giving and receiving love. Loving, Loving consciously. consciously. Together, we have overcome neurodivergence, mental health, addiction, pregnancy loss, infidelity, and grief. After six years, the lack of knowledge on how to heal or love each other through these challenges led to our separation. After us both spiritually awakening and recommitting, we built our new conscious partnership founded on unconditional love and a commitment to personal growth. Thank you for joining us as we put it all out there to show you the duality of our love's pain and beauty. And remind you that you have both the capacity to love consciously and the power to always, always choose love. Namaste and welcome back to the Loving Consciously podcast. We are so excited to be here with you today. We have a beautiful guest, and I'm so excited to bring this topic of the Divine Mother to you all. We have today with us Alejandra Valenzuela, and we had the joy and pleasure of meeting her at the Conscious Life Expo, where we got to attend her workshop. I was just really struck by how embodied in the Divine Feminine energy you were and how much wisdom you had on the ways in which the Divine Mother manifests and the ways in which we can work with that energy. And so I'll pass it off to you to go ahead and intro who you are and what you do and all of those fun things. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And can I just share that you guys embody literally a, a vibration of just sacred coupling and relationship and it really touched my heart to meet you guys both at the conference. So whatever I transmitted to you energetically, I experienced so much from both of you. So thank you for that. Yeah, I am. My name is Alejandra. Like you said, I'm from Southern California. I was born and raised here in Los Angeles and grew up a pretty normal California girl, you know, Catholic background, Mexican-American background. I've always been surrounded by very strong women, beautiful. Thankfully, my, you know, my mother, who is still here today, Thank goodness, um, my grandmothers who have crossed over, I have been surrounded by, and, and then even in my family, there were more, so many more girl cousins than guy cousins. <laughs> so I've been surrounded by female tribes for a very long time. I think uh, being raised Catholic and also being Mexican, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, La Virgen de Guadalupe has just been such a big loving divine mother presence in my life so it's kind of you know the spiritual path that i found myself here today talking about the moon and the vibration of the divine mother it took a long time to get me here i've had many in life iterations right commercial real estate and nonprofit background but you know fast forward to now and this feels like what i'm supposed to be doing mm. I love that. I didn't know you were in commercial real estate. That's so different. That's like <laughs> yes. such a, I feel so like different. masculine <laughs> role for someone that is so yes. embodied in the feminine. That's interesting. Yeah. So before I ask you our intro question, we ask all of our guests. I'm curious if you can share a little bit about your spiritual journey and kind of 
how you came to be quote unquote spiritual or conscious or all those words we can use for labels, but what brought you to this place in your journey? I love that. I went to church from a very young age. So I was, as I said, I was raised Catholic and that activated obviously some beautiful place of faith inside of me. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Jesus, Mother Mary, the saints, the angels, we have all of that in Catholicism. I guess it was probably later in life where I stepped away from the church just because I saw the difference between what my faith was inside my heart versus what I saw in terms of dogma and structure. You know, and then I would go to a yoga class and learn about Kundalini energy or, you know, the Indian gods and goddesses. And I just started to love it all, truly love it all. You know, I heard about my sister was really excited about the Baha'i faith. And I was like, what's that? You know, like, so it's been this, this search, really a quest to find love and God in everything. But what really broke me open, like broke the coconut just wide open, was going down to Brazil in a state of searching. And quite honestly, it felt like my heart was blocked. Um, Love, searching for love, that I guess is my ultimate quest in this life. (laughs) Isn't it for all of us? Right. I mean, it's it's love, self-love, to be in partnership, all of it. Well, you're on and... the right podcast because that's what we do here. We are all about the love. It's just perfect, which is why like souls like this are uniting right now. You know, we find each other eventually, right? But I went down to this random, like tiny little town in the middle of Brazil, in the central plains of Brazil. And there was this famous healer there. Uh, his name was John of God, and he would perform these miraculous operations on people, spiritual interventions that no anesthesia, this man would just channel and, you know, take a knife and literally make an incision on someone, cut them open, pull something out and sew them up with a needle and just send them for 24 hours bed rest and then they'd be cured. <laughs> I mean, wild, wild, wild stuff. I didn't want a physical surgery. Um, You could also have what they just call a spiritual surgery or intervention where you don't have to be touched. You just sit in the quote unquote surgery room, which is basically a meditation room. And you allow the surgery to happen in some other dimension or realm. And then you go home and rest. So I went down there hoping to get this intervention and I got rejected. (laughs) I remember this part of the story from your <laughs> workshop. I think there's still a little bit of salty energy about it. <laughs> but the best thing came of it, right? Like the, the next part that thing. comes is so God. Like God had something way bigger for you. Exactly. And it was so the message that God knows, the universe knows what it's doing, right? I have a friend who always says that. And they knew that by being rejected from a surgery, I was not about to leave Brazil not getting anything. You know, so I had to search for something. And that's when I found the plant medicine, ayahuasca. And Mm, we know her well. uh, Right. I I knew nothing of ayahuasca, you guys. I had, but interestingly enough, leading up to my trip to Brazil. So I had heard the word ayahuasca one time in my life, years before. And leading up to this trip to Brazil, with three people in three different conversations, that word came up. And so all of a sudden I'm in Brazil and this guy's like, yeah, I go to this church where we drink ayahuasca. It was like my chihuahua ear was like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I'm supposed to follow these breadcrumbs and see what happens. And that literally was the moment that I just broke open. And from there, you know, returning back to Los Angeles, my My life didn't feel the same, you know, it was like putting on clothes and they don't fit you anymore. That's what it felt like. And so it started my spiritual journey. That's a really beautiful share. Thank you for sharing that with us. I can totally relate to, yeah, what you, first of all, what you said about like loving it all, I got full body chills when you were talking because 
you know, Eric has a Catholic background and I was exposed to a lot of religion growing up. And our journey has very much been that of just loving everything, loving different pieces from different parts of all of the religion and spirituality. Like there's no one thing, right? Right. And same with ayahuasca. You know, we sat with Aya earlier this year and yeah, Amazing. you come, you just come back different. Like it's full death and coming back into life and you're just such a new being and a new person and it just broken open is such a good analogy. <laughs> Moving into this question, I'm curious what loving consciously looks like in your life. That can be romantically with your family, with yourself. Like how do you consciously love today? Mm, I love this so much. So I um, did not know at first that it starts from within, at least for me. Loving consciously right now, deep, deep work that I'm doing is with my little girl, my inner child. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I cannot believe how easy it, it has been in the past. I'm going to be careful with my language too. How easy it's been in the past to forget about her. And as a grown woman, all of a sudden see myself in complete breakdown and pointing fingers outside of myself when really it's literally this inner child just screaming at me for my attention. And that will be my eternal work, not just in this life, but in every life I have. And I hope to God I remember this lesson. But I think from there, then I get to see it ripple out. You know, the image of me and my dog came to me as you said that, because it's so easy to give love to a dog. It's so easy to say, come here and do the little kisses and change your voice, you know, and that I think, wow, all of that directed to this animal. Why can't I just direct it in, you know, and yeah, direct it internally and then let, let that ripple out into all my relationships. That's my mm. goal. That is beautiful. And it's really interesting. You're like our, maybe our fourth guest and every single guest says the same thing, like inherently of yeah. it's all self, right? It's all yeah. coming back within. And I love that you tied that to the inner child because it's something we talk a lot about, especially me, that journey of like loving that little girl. You know, she was pretty angry and, and it still is sometimes. And yeah, just temper tantrums, you know, sometimes you just got to let them happen. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing that because I feel like everybody's inner child is something that we're working to heal and create conscious relationship right now. It's been a season that we've noticed in a lot of our conscious community and extended community that it's really been a time of looking inward and starting to learn how to love ourselves because so much time has been spent seeking that external love, right? Looking for the things that we need from our partners, our family, our friends, our coworkers, whatever it may be conscious relating and conscious love really does start with the self because when we love ourselves fully we no longer expect or need anything from anybody else and we can all come to the table on equal ground with really just the intention of loving each other and not taking anything from anybody else yeah I love that I love that and people feel so safe you know when you know that they love themselves they feel safe because they have their boundaries. They know what they want to allow in, what they want to keep out, and they're grounded. You know, there's not the the competition or ego or any kind of agenda. It's just, this is a safe person. And I really like that. So before moving into this, I want to give a little bit of a kind of disclaimer. We often give this on the show when we're talking about topics like this, but just to anybody listening, when we say, you know, mother and feminine and all of these things, like we're talking about energy, right? We're talking about that half of the yin yang. It's not necessarily correlated with gender, though some of these things will be correlated with gender. This is like the, the feminine energy of creation and the way that that manifests. And I was thinking about that, getting ready for this. And I have this like big old list of things and we can go into whichever ones you want to go into. This is your show. But I was <laughs> thinking about Mother Gaia, right? Mother mm -hmm. Earth. Um, we have the moon, which I know is one of your favorites. And that's what your mm -hmm. workshop was on, the lunar yeah. goddess and the lady of Guadalupe. You have all of the various goddesses. 
And then I was also thinking about mama, we call her mama cannabis. And same with ayahuasca. We all know we call her mama Aya. And she Mm -hmm. definitely has that, while brutal, gentle, you know, feminine, (laughs) motherly energy. And so when we look at a lot of these healing modalities and a lot of these things in nature, especially, we see that divine mother, that divine feminine Whichever of those you want to start with or whichever ones you want to dig into, we can talk about the moon, we can talk about ayahuasca, but what is kind of your background in working with the divine mother, divine feminine energy? I love that. Thank you so much. And yeah, those are like just great examples of her presence all around us. I think it would probably be uh, what, what feels aligned for me is actually to begin with the earth because this is our home and literally from her, I, I I believe I'm of the belief that she is our oldest teacher. And every lesson we possibly need to learn in life, she shows us on a daily basis or through her cycles or through her elements. For me, it all starts with the earth. I think one of the, because from there, then the plant medicine comes, right? Ayahuasca comes from the earth, right? It's her, it's her milk that she's giving to drink. Mm-hmm the moon is following around her rhythm, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just this magnetic pull everybody has to the earth. After I had that whole spiritual awakening, I moved to Brazil, I said goodbye to LA and was like, Full freaked sick. everybody out. <laughs> we got to meet your dearly sweet beloved mother, and I believe yes. your sister as well, yes. and a few of your other family members, and they're all so sweet and you can just tell though they've had years to really come around on this like how Mm -hmm. much this was quite a lot for your family to process that you like (laughs) go on this vacation drink ayahuasca and then move to brazil (laughs) (laughs) sounds like something i would do (laughs) (laughs) well kindred kindred spirits for sure my tia it's so funny after that conference my tia said miha i think i understand you better (laughs) so it was one of those things where they could they could see me now because no one can understand when you come back after saying, I drink ayahuasca and I can no longer live in Los Angeles. I can no longer have this job. I can no longer live in my apartment. I need to go. And people asking, well, what's your plan? And having no response. I, I don't know. I'm just going to go live. That's That's all I know. I love my family. And thank goodness we're still together and close because of it. So lots of healing since then. When I started to live in Brazil, you have to imagine I'm coming from Los Angeles and all of a sudden I'm in the central grasslands of Brazil. There is nature all around me. This Mm -hmm. town is, you know, cannot possibly have more than like 30,000 people in it. And that's only on like one side. There was like a foreigner side where people would live on the opposite side of the highway where the Casa was and where... A bunch of tourists would come, but um, there was this uh, a, a falling of grace of the healer, and everything shut down. And then, um, so people weren't visiting anymore, and it became quite literally a ghost town. You know, no physical people, not many there, and also the spirits were still there. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing, and I would go out every day. I take my rosary and sunset, sunset prayers were always, sunset and sunrise prayers were always my favorite. I wouldn't always make it up for the sunrise, but for the sunset, I'd always go at six o'clock, almost to the dot every day. Listening to the cicadas would start to make noise when, um, and that meant that the rains were going to be coming. You know, I'd, I'd start to feel the movement and the cycles and I'd sit with her I'd sit on the earth, I'd, I'd just put my feet there, I'd put my hands and just feel her, let her hold me. And simple, I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't trying to channel anything, I was just trying to be present. And through those movements, this communication started to happen with her, very surprisingly. And, you know, to feel to feel held by this loving presence on a daily basis and to realize, you know, it's, it's harder in the cities 
to get this connection, right? We become disconnected. The more buildings are around, the more, I mean, you guys know this, you we're, we're off the grid kind of people, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And, you know, the things that would happen, mud, mudslides that would occur or fires that would break out and to see the rejuvenation of life, to see, okay, a fire is happening. Sometimes things get wiped out completely in our lives unceremoniously at times, you know, some, some are planned fires, right. When people are burning things, but others are wild and, and what happens? Well, fire supports the soil. And, and all of a sudden you'd see this new life. There's, I'd see these shoots of green coming out amidst like all of these grasslands that were just charcoal black. And it was amazing to see, like, there's no judgment in what has happened. I will just continue living. I will just continue growing. I will just continue being what I am here to be and express within me. Pick something we want to like learn about and Mother Nature's right there teaching us. Okay, here's how this works. <laughs> That's what it felt like. I love that so much. And I don't know why this just came to my mind, but right when you said that, pick something. What I heard in my in my brain, something that I've learned from nature is looking at rivers or water in nature and learning about surrender, right? Like flowing with the current and kind of the ridiculousness of fighting against the flow of life or the flow of water or the flow of whatever it is in your life. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of surrender, I always think of a river flowing. And oh, I love that. yeah, I just love so much that you chose Mother Earth because it really does all come back to that. And, you know, we're coming off of Earth Day and we're in a journey of going to be stewarding land soon and reconnecting to nature has been a really big part of our journey. And especially after our ayahuasca ceremony, the first thing that I did was drive all the way up the West Coast to go lay in the redwoods because I just wanted to be held <laughs> by the trees. <laughs> yes. Working in that, what are some of like your favorite ways that you think that people can start to kind of work with that divine feminine energy of the earth? If they're maybe feeling stuck or they're moving through something really difficult, what are some things that you do with nature, with, with this beautiful planet that we have to kind of start to cultivate some of that healing energy? Oh, I love that. And I love that you brought up the redwoods. I used to live up north in literally in a redwood forest. And I heard a channeling that um, the goddess Venus gifted the redwoods to the earth. So whenever I'm in the redwoods, I feel like I'm in Venusian territory and Venusian land, you know, the, the tallest creatures on our planet, you know. I have never heard that, but I'm speechless and floored and not at all because <laughs> Venus has been very present in my life and I'm like obsessed with the Redwoods and we're moving to NorCal. So of course <laughs> there's, there's a synchronicity right there, but yeah, it's really yeah. cool for sharing that. Oh my God, you're, you're welcome. Well, my favorite thing to do in nature is especially, I mean, I, I live on the West coast, so I love going to the beach. But honestly, just putting in the iPod and rocking out in a dance, and I'm dancing for her. I dance to the ocean. I dance to the waves. I dance to the birds flying. It's like I call in my sacred appreciation to be her child. You know, it might seem ridiculous at first, like, oh, okay, I'm going to go and just dance for, <laughs> dance for Mother Earth, right? But how else have we shown devotion in this world? I mean, the two most ancient forms of art and devotion is singing and dancing. You know, I don't know which one came first, but it's it's one or the other. And it's our way of adoring her. And I feel like people, like the the animal kingdom definitely picks up on that when we become in tune because their rhythm is so connected, right? It's, they get it. They just, they totally get it. And I had this one relationship with like this seal that would keep popping up every time I'd go and dance. And then I'd wave high at it. And, you know, I would see it swim over there, but it would always come to the little cove where I was and it would pop its head up and I would just, you know, wave like, hello. And then I'd look up, well, what does seal medicine mean? You know, I'd, I'd also try and pay attention to, not just what you are doing to give your appreciation to nature, but how is nature speaking back to you? Animal medicine, spirit medicine, the animals, 
I love that. I love listening to things like that. There's also like certain times where you can go and strengthen your connection. I love going on the new moons and the full moons, right? Because this is a symbolic relationship with our, I call her our closest dance partner. And mm -hmm. when you look at the cosmos and the sky and everything is a celestial dance, Mother Moon is the Earth's closest dance partner, always weaving around her and pulling quite literally the forces of the water of the earth, which activates and pulls the forces of water within us. If we're, if we're the same as the earth, if we're truly her child, then we are of the earth. We are, the moon also activates those waters within us. So with um, new moons, it's always a great time. Any kind of ceremony you'd like to do, you know, it's just a treat. It's a real treat. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. You touched on so many golden nuggets there. I mean, the relationship that we have with Mother Earth and how it's a reflection of our own internal and spiritual landscape as well. When we sit and we observe the seasons and the way that Mother Earth heals herself, we can be informed of how the patterns in our own lives can be transmuted and healed. Just simply by sitting and observing nature, we can learn so much about what's going on in our own landscape. Mm -hmm. And then this utilization of dance as devotion, it really is such a ancestral and tribal and natural flow of movement and connection with the energy. As you know, I also work with dance as a healing modality. And I remember... Move. Yeah, yes. and to move and connect with, with the energies of the earth and divine spirits. And recently, it's been this beautiful act of devotion, not just with the divine, but also with my partner, to be able mm -hmm. to connect energies in movement with something else. It really is a sacred act. And the beautiful thing about it is that everybody has their own flow. Everybody has their own frequency. And when you see how your frequency interacts with the world and interacts with the frequency of another, you create this beautiful art that can't be replicated. And it, it's a really deep, deep connection. So thank you so much for sharing that and for sharing about how the moon really is a gateway and a channel to connecting with Mother Earth and how it informs, much like a dance partner, the movement and, and the energies that we cultivate throughout different seasons. Could you share a little mm -hmm. bit more about how the Divine Mother manifests through the moon and the energies that are available to us during different time frames? Yeah, absolutely. I will give you a really good example that I just learned recently. You know, when I lived in Brazil, I, at one point I went to the coast, I went to Bahia, and I was watching a bunch of turtle births happening. And what I was told is that turtles will hear the rhythm of the ocean. And so when they're born, you typically like at night or like really early morning, you have to go and like witness them, that they'll hear the rhythm of the ocean and that's what pulls them to it. But I checked about this recently. And in fact, it's not the rhythm of the ocean. They follow the light. Well, if you think about it, if you're in pristine nature, without any kind of disturbance from artificial an artificial light source, what lights the ocean is the moon. The moon reflects its brilliance off the water and turtles follow literally the light of our mother moon to their destiny, right? They know she's the one guiding them. And when you look up turtle medicine, they will typically associate it with the energy of the earth. I had a beautiful experience in um, an Aya ceremony where I was like deep in the ocean with these turtles, like when uh, spending time along the coast. And um, I saw this formation take place and kind of like a turtle showed up and then all of a sudden another one underneath and their two halves came together and it formed the earth. And it was like blowing my mind, like, this is why, this is earth medicine, I get it, you know, understanding it. If the moon is a guide for 
our animals, she's clearly a guide for us as human beings. And, and this has been documented for centuries. We've just lost the knowledge once astrology was, you know, considered some hocus pocus, you know, new age, it wasn't scientific enough for the academics, and it sort of got casted away. But I think there is a resurgence of our Divine Mother in many different ways. And working with the moon, I, I truly envision a, our humanity in a way that we will be working with this. So following her cycles, to answer your question of, you know, when would be good times to work with her, from the new moon to the full moon. If you think about it in terms of like an archetype, what you see is the moon goes from complete darkness all the way to its most brilliant light and obviously lit by the sun. The interesting thing about our moon is she doesn't have any light of her own. All of it is provided by her divine counterpart, the sun. I just love this um, because that shows you the sacred relationship also with like the alpha and the omega. And as the moon, and the moon was associated in ancient astrology with kind of like our fate, and our fortune, because its face is constantly changing. You can, and, and also its location. You kind of never know when you're going to wake up and see, like, where is it today? You know, or what phase is it in today? And that was associated with the, the changes and the fluctuations of the earthly realm. Whereas the sun, Father Sun, was constant. Every day it rose in the same place, set in the same place. Its sun was, its face never changed. So, as this, when you think about the light coming to fruition, right, it's the, the moon is sort of birthing itself into its full illumination. It's a time in our lives that's very activated so that we strive towards our goals. It's a time of, you know, getting in and doing the work, whatever that word work looks like for you, right? For many people, it's, it's different things. The new moon is like, a seeding moment where you set an intention and you plant that. I literally I envision that there is a garden within me, just like the garden outside in the world. There's a garden inside of me and I will plant seeds of intention on every new moon. I'll write them down in a journal, I'll put them in a God box. And I keep that so that I always remember this is the seed I planted this month. And understanding that, like Mother Earth shows us, it takes time for things to grow and cultivate. But as the moon is in its waxing phase where light is increasing, that is the time to really go for it. And what did you say your seed was? Okay, so do everything in your power to follow that wish, that desire. And then when it comes to the full moon, it's kind of like the ultimate act of surrender. Okay, let it go. Miha, you're not supposed to keep like striving after things with all your might. Sometimes you have to trust <laughs> and let it go, <laughs> which is so beautiful that the moon shows us. We're not always supposed to be constantly in action. Then when the light starts to wane and goes down to the, to the new moon phase again, to the dark moon, then that's the time where you start to clear out your garden, where you start to pull some weeds, where you're not really planting, you're sort of assessing what needs to leave here? What needs to go? What needs to change? And then every month you, you do this act over and over and over again. And the beauty with the astrology, when you layer them on top of each other, is your astrology is going to hit a different house in your chart every month. So it's funny when I think of people are like, well, what are you calling in? And I'm calling in more money, more abundance. Okay, great. The next moon, new moon comes. What are you calling in? Same thing. More money. I want like this much in my bank account, you know, whatever. Okay, great. And they keep planting the same seed when what in nature is trying to show us is that we need to diversify, that it cannot be just one crop, right? The, the, the single crops, the mono crop fields that you see that just destroy the land. It ain't about that. It is about reaching and activating all different facets of ourselves and what we're creating. Mm, that was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that wisdom about <laughs> the moon and the cycles. And 
as you're talking, I'm just thinking about how this started manifesting in my life this year is right around ayahuasca, my cycles linked up with the moon within 24 wow. hours of the full moon. And so I've, wow. my body entered this very rhythmic cycle of ovulating on the new moon and then menstruating on the full moon. Wow. And another thing I was thinking about, and I don't even honestly think we've told anybody this because it just wouldn't have come up. And so I'm really excited to share this here. But when we took your workshop, you did a really beautiful exercise. Was it not on the new moon? Did I imagine that? Uh, no, yeah, it was. It was it like was the day moon, yeah. of the new moon. Yeah. <laughs> and we, which is super cool because that would have meant I was ovulating, but you gave out these little, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what the words were for the seeds. Can you remind me? The what this Job's was? tears. Job's, Job's tears, tears, tears seeds. seeds. Mm -hmm. And had us all set intentions. And with our seeds, we set the intentions for being parents and for all that that mm -hmm. journey has. And those seeds are sitting three feet away from me on our altar. Ah! They're, they're going to stay there until that seed is ready to be birthed to life whenever that is divinely aligned for us. So thank you for that. <laughs> and I just loved that represent that physical representation of taking an actual seed. You know, you talked about like having a garden within yourself and, you know, to our listeners, you can like physically do that. You can actually plant something. You can actually get a physical seed to represent whatever intention you're setting. And I also love that you tied it to astrology. I just recently learned about the houses and the moons and all of the things. And it's, it's just like, I don't, it makes me dizzy thinking about <laughs> the plethora of wisdom and also of energy that like our mother earth divine feminine moon whatever you want to call that energy has to offer us there are so many ways to work with it and even if you just pick one right just one way to like start intentionally doing that you can see like radical changes and so I just love so much talking about the moon and and your your lunar goddess within I think was the name of your course and ever since then yeah. I've just been very intricately tied to the moon and the moon cycles and paying attention to what is being shown to us in that in that light in that cycle oh I love that so much it is my goal I mean imagine if every woman I mean also man but you know women were the keepers of this wisdom back mm -hmm. in the day and it because it reflected our, our own moon cycle and within and if every woman on the planet was actively working with the moon if they're intentional prayers were being set every month i think we would fundamentally see a shift energetically and we our earth would truly be different you know energy would be intentionally focused and hopefully love in a loving way <laughs> and it's just a it's a, a prayer that i hold in my heart and i do believe that more women are waking up to this and when men join in amen hallelujah because <laughs> it's just really a really beautiful way to mm -hmm. honor you know what we see right in front of us every day absolutely I was getting a little emotional while you were talking because the the feminine the divine feminine the word that we've been using is like exaltation right exalting like that is mm -hmm. the season we're in and all of the women in my life or I guess all of the feminine in my life we're starting to share and see this thread. And I don't know if you resonate with this, but it really is a time of feminine awakening, of feminine power, of reactivating and re-exalting this deeply oppressed and abused and forgotten energy of the feminine and how powerful that is. And something that I heard recently that came to me right now while you were talking, I was at a festival recently and I was in a workshop and it was actually the workshop was called blood magic but it was talking about working with your cycles and that's a whole other episode we won't get into but something that the presenter said was when all of the womb and like wombs or women right uh -huh. start working with their cycles intentionally as offerings and healing the men will come home from war because there will be no more need for bloodshed and the most beautiful moment of my feminine path in this lifetime happened in that workshop because I watched myself and all of the women in that room collectively start weeping, like just mm. weeping because it was so resonant to like the core of my soul that 
you're right. Like if we all as women, as feminine energy started working with our cycles, the moon, mother earth, I truly believe we could completely transform and transmute this world in like months, like such a small amount of time with that intentional energy, because when backed, right, and exalted by the masculine and held by the masculine, because this is this is a two part game here. We really do like, like a lotus, right? We like bloom into this beautiful divine feminine and that love and that tenderness and all of the things that is the divine feminine is so powerful. There really is such strength in feminine and the dance that happens between the divine masculine and divine feminine on both parts there she can be in her divine masculine holding my divine feminine and vice versa in that Mm -hmm. the divine masculine creates this structure it creates this container for the feminine to truly shine their light to flow to create to nurture what is being birthed into this world and Mm -hmm. when the masculine can hold that container which starts by you know, holding the container for yourself and self-love as we talked about earlier it it's beautiful what the what the feminine can create you know we've discovered this in our relationship even just recently the dynamic between when space is being held and when there's more of a a resistance and and kind of like a lack of safety within myself and so that I'm mm-hmm. not able to hold that space for her there's this breakdown in the structure of the relationship. And that Mm -hmm. goes with partners, that goes with friendships, that goes with, you know, our relationship to the earth too. We have to hold that structure to be able to be in conscious partnership with the Mm -hmm. moon, with the earth, with the energies that are present here so that we can co-create beautiful life and just love and everything that this world was meant to be. I love that. And honestly, I think that the divine masculine is so misunderstood, or I guess what, you know, what truly constitute that, that divine masculinity. And, you know, when you look at the sun and you look at the moon, the two luminaries in our world, it's the foundation and the basis for all of astrology. If you just look at what their acts do, the sun appears to be as the same size as the moon okay even though they are so far apart distance wise from earth okay so there's an equality there you see it archetypally Mm. that even though the moon is so much smaller because it's so much closer it looks just as big as the sun apart from that the sun if it did not shine its light to support earth nothing would grow. The fertility that can awaken within the feminine would not exist without the sunlight because it has no light source of its own. It has to work in communion with one another. And unfortunately, what has transpired throughout the years is this hijacking of of the feminine, right? And, And made it subservient it's like it, it's like if you were to go outside and look at the sun and the moon the moon would be a tiny little you know maybe maybe a little bigger than a star you know or maybe some star clusters but the sun would still be massive and big it's something would be off in our eye if we walked out and we saw that in real life and yet we energetically are experiencing that on earth and we take we treat it as normal or, or maybe I shouldn't say we treat it as normal. For some reason, it continues to exist. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think that when the, when the divine feminine no longer appears to be a threat, for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's the, the fact that there is such power held within the feminine, right? Or it, it's the one to create life. It literally creates life. That's a lot of power. And once that is being placed once again at its rightful place next to this divine masculine, then we'll start to see that toxicity, you know, go away. I I wanted to share that I even see this and 
maybe I'll say a disclaimer before I speak about it is um, I'd, I'd like to talk about something related to sexual assault and um, the way I looked at it through a spiritual lens. Would that be okay to share? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah we have dove into that topic. That's actually what came of my ayahuasca ceremony. And so this is a safe mm -hmm. container. I appreciate you giving the disclaimer. So if you're listening and you don't want to hear this portion, thank you for, for giving that. But yes, safe yeah. container. Thank you for that. When I was healing, when I was doing all this healing in Brazil, there was a lot um, put on a focus and emphasis on previous sexual assaults that I've experienced. When Aya comes in and all of a sudden it's working with your consciousness and it's taking you to incredible places of discovery, what I got to see is looking at sexual assault from a place of spiritual awareness in the sense that I saw that there were two wounded people in this situation, right? The perpetrator and the victim. All of our emphasis, and, and rightly so, I mean, it's understanding if a house is on fire, you get a hose and you want to put out the fire, right? You're not really worried about who started it at that moment, right? And so if we look at that as a metaphor about sexual assault and all the resources put for survivors, there's a complete disconnect from resources that need to support the perpetrator who has committed this act in the spirit of a deep wound within them. So I saw that when rape is reported, when sexual assault is reported, there's this movement taking place inside a survivor that is coming from a divine feminine energy. And that divine feminine energy is the essence of the divine mother. The divine mother knows how to handle chaos, right? Which is what a survivor experiences after something like that. And this chaos magic that can be inside, when it is taken into the womb of the divine mother, she's the one who looks and says, okay, what are my children needing? What are they asking for? How can I bring healing to them? The first act is to speak of what happened, to reveal what the problem is. And so that act of literally speaking and reporting is coming from the mother because she's recognizing once it is spoken, this is not just to help this person who was, who was assaulted, but it's also to call into this, this place the perpetrator so you get to see because they need support also that the healing by speaking sexual assault is actually for both parties not just for one Whew, i'm gonna take a breath before responding to that one <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> first, first and foremost i'm so grateful that you brought this up because it is only in living in the shadows and living in the shame and living in the, ooh, that's uncomfortable, that's yucky. We don't want to face that, right? When we talk about sexual assault, uh, child, right? Child assaults, uh, tra yeah. trafficking, human trafficking, all of these things, that is a reality of this planet. And it is a reality that is being actively purged right now and that is going to come to the light. And we have to talk about these things. So yeah. first and foremost, thank you for talking about it because- <laughs> It's very prevalent and it's only in facing those shadows and meeting them with love and being open and authentic that we can move through them, right? We can't move around them. We've got to move through them. The other thing that I was thinking about is in you talking about how like the feminine knows how to deal with this. And I think that's why it's so common with ayahuasca, especially to have these things come up. It happened, mm -hmm. you know, for you, it happened for me. It really is like this perfect container of being held the way I experienced it in my Aya ceremony was you know mama Aya is what I call her I was going through it going through it for hours and hours all kinds of different beautiful and intense and emotional journeys and then we got to the end and what I thought was the end and she told me there's one thing left we need to do together and the only way to move this is to move through it and is to purge at that point I hadn't physically vomited and purged I was purging in every other way possible right energetically <laughs> crying yawning sweating shaking yeah. and she told me you know we have to move through this and we have to physically purge out this 
what I experienced as a demon or a darkness, an entity that had entered my my orc field, my body as a result of this abuse. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, it was current life, past life and ancestral. They all three came up. And so I'm still, you know, sitting in the mud of like, what's mine? What's, you know, my family members? What's a past life? But my whole point is through that divine mother feminine ayahuasca energy, I was able to do exactly what you said, which is speak it, right? And finally start claiming that and moving through that energy. And so I love the tie here of how us as a collective, and this is not just for the feminine, right? This is for all of us. We're all one. We're all one big family. We can lean on this. We can lean on this energy. We can use all of those things we listed in the intro, right? It can be the earth. It can be the moon. It can be plant medicines that are feminine, goddesses, religious figures. It doesn't matter. Whatever connection you have with the divine mother, you can use that to heal. You can use that to hold you and to support you because without that divine feminine energy, I don't know that I would have made it through this, you know, and mm -hmm. I've had so many experiences. I had a few before this, but since I, in the last, what, four months it's been, I've had dozens of experiences of being held by that energy. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. physical on the earth. Sometimes it's energetic. I always go into the, like the fetal position and I just, I imagine a mother rocking me or I kind of like flow with the water. And it's like that ultimate divine mother love that we're all really just seeking. And every time it's so healing for my soul. And so, you know, if anybody's listening and they're moving through any type of trauma, but especially anything around sexual trauma, which we're all touched by, if it's not us, it's our family, our ancestors, or our past lives. I truly believe mm -hmm. we all have this in some way. This is such a beautiful way to start transmuting that. So thank you for bringing that. And, you know, for doing that work, this is tough work. And it's us women and us feminine who are moving through that for the collective that are really starting to make that change and make that growth. Yeah. And and I heard you say that you were able to speak about it. So congratulations to that, because that is huge. That is a huge milestone from the inner side, the inside finding inner strength and feeling and knowing you're going to be supported with that truth being spoken into the world. So I honor that of you. I received that. It really does speak to the power and the strength of the feminine to be able to move and transmute these types of energies. The mm -hmm. analogy that you were sharing about how the discrepancy in, in partnership of the divine masculine with the divine feminine in that, that the sun, you know, if we really took a look at it and it, it was this massive ball versus the moon in the smaller, smaller sphere, there's, there's a disresonance in the energy. We are mm -hmm. equals. We are equal partners. We're yin and yang. We're to match and dance in, in unison to support each other through this world and the energies that come of it. And when one attempts to control the other, whether it be from fear, whether it be from hurt or anger, whatever that may be, that disresonance is a call for now both partners to come together and learn how to come back in unison. Because mm -hmm. if either one then starts to say, no, I'm the victim. No, you're the perpetrator. I'm the per perpetrator. You're the victim. It will always be a cycle of one being larger than the other or a dance partner you know if the one who's in the masculine role and is in that leadership role there to provide the structure for the other person to move if they're mm -hmm. pulling and yanking on the other person dragging them around what kind of dance is that mm -hmm. there's strength in the feminine in that you have your voice you have the ability to move through deep deep pain and transmute that for the collective by working with your cycles by working with the moon and the energy and bringing to light the shadows that are present on this planet you call forth the divine masculine and that's something that we recently experienced in our partnership too is this balance of her calling out the divine masculine and bringing me back to center which allows me then to create the container for her to move the energy as is natural in her body. And so that, that relationship of saying, I've chosen to take 
as the feminine. I've chosen to take the burden of the collective and this energy and move it through to purge it through. I'm going to bring it to light. I'm going to hold the divine masculine accountable and love them unconditionally and forgive them and hold space for them so that they can move forward out of their shadow and create mm -hmm. that structure and that container for everybody to return to love. That actually bled right in so beautifully to one thing I forgot to mention that you said that is speaks volumes to the level of work that you've done when you were talking about victim and perpetrator, right? Like we use those words loosely, all situations, right? Both people are victim if pain happened. If we were outside of truth, aka outside of love, then we both were harmed in some way from that interaction most people hear that and they're like yeah okay i i can kind of see that right but then when we move into like sexual assault for example it gets a little bit tougher for the greater collective to see it that way and to understand that anything anybody did was from a deep place of wounding and disresonance and darkness dark energy whatever that is and as a collective in order to continue to move out of the place that we're in right now mm -hmm. all perspectives have to be welcome all right. people have to be loved and that includes the people who may have done these acts who may have been the quote unquote you know perpetrator of these acts and so we have to have space for all people to heal and all people to be loved and all perspectives to be valid and that is really difficult you know if you haven't done that deep inner work right. and i truly believe this is where the divine feminine comes in this is what she has to offer us is in understanding that and in being able to accept that, you know, when I was looking at some of the stuff that was coming up for me around sexual abuse and just all my sexual life in general as a woman, there was initially a lot of anger. And then really quickly, because of so much of the work I'd done and because I had been in a season of cultivating that divine feminine energy already prior to Mama Aya, I was able to very quickly, I mean, within like 48 hours, be like, I love and forgive these people. Like, what what did they go through as 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 a child or in past lives or ancestral to to bring them into that place? And so I think that's so important to highlight because we have to make room for everybody. Like everybody has to heal. All of our child sex offenders, all of our people who've committed those acts, they are going to coexist in this new earth with us. And so thank you for bringing that beautiful perspective that I'm not sure everybody's ready for yet, but I think we're getting there. I just wanted to thank you. And I think that what I heard you say in that is you were able to forgive them quickly as soon as you felt that in your heart click, you know, which is the beauty of what ayahuasca can do for so many, so many of us, right? And that's the mother's milk mm. going through you drinking like a baby, you know, what's the healthiest thing you can give that baby, the mother's milk. It's that is her nourishing your spirit and your soul. And for you to do that in 48 hours, that's pretty darn incredible. So that, you know, it's okay if um, maybe people listening aren't quite on that trajectory. <laughs> maybe it's going to take... It's not to say it was all done in 48 hours. I just was that piece. I was able to start cultivating compassion pretty oh, quickly, but yeah, it's still a journey. We're We're still moving through it. It is a journey. And I, I wanted to say one last thing with in terms of is the collective ready for this? You know, I was recently at a fundraiser, April when last month was um, sexual assault and awareness month. And I went to a fundraiser and I heard people speaking and I could energetically feel how threatening this type of message would feel in that room in that climate. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not necessarily ready for um, certain venues or functions, maybe with the proper groundwork and um, intention setting. One of the things, though, that I do believe is ready is to work with first responders and the people that are the ones handling, prosecuting the cases, uh, victim advocates, um, you know, any any type of first responder to that area of sexual assault, if they could start to see it as this place of, okay, there's not just one wounded person in here, there are two, and hold that as they work in this field, that might be the first way to mm -hmm. really start shifting energy around it. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I, I just echo that again of 
two wounded people, right? Hurt people, hurt people, and then we hurt people more, and then the hurt continues genetically. It passes through us, and yeah, I mean that's that's re- I did such a good idea of a great place to start is working with those people that are touching that every day. That's my yeah. goal. I hope to. I hope I can do that. <laughs> you will. You will do that. And another impactful thing that came while you two were sharing was that it really isn't a personal experience. If we take a step back and realize that this is energy that's being moved and flowed through the greater collective, it's trauma that's passed down from generation and asking to be transmuted. What an honor to be witness to you two women who have, before coming down here, made the soul contract to go through what you went through so that that energy could be transmuted and turned to love to turn Mm -hmm. into compassion because that is some deep work that not everybody is capable of holding the container for. That's what I say when I say there's so much strength in the divine feminine because that is quite literally healing ages of trauma and energy stored in the masculine, right? Mm -hmm. When we look at this from a spiritual perspective and take out our individual bodies and our vehicles and look at just the collective as a whole, the feminine is actually starting to hold the container for the masculine to heal during this time because so much oppression has happened and that the scale has tilted so much. It's actually the feminine that's being called forward to hold that space for the masculine so they can come and cry and weep and feel that energy through and then allow that to be transmuted i'm kind of over here giggling and i just i have to give this moment for all my feminine sisters out there of course we would be the ones to be oppressed and abused and insert blank for like eons and then also still be the ones to come forward and hold the container call them forward and start transmuting that that's just the power of us right that's the power of the divine mother it's such a perfect summary of how powerful we are and the healing work as women that we can do the last thing i want to ask you is what is or are however much you want to share some of the core things core lessons core insights that you've received from working with the divine mother that you think you know, nuggets that people can take with them that you've learned as you've kind of been on this deep journey of working with all of these avenues of the divine feminine? Mm. Oh, it's such a rich, deep question. Let me sit with this just for a second. Absolutely. Take your time. Tap in. What immediately comes to me, there was this phrase and it was so important for me that I wrote it on a postcard and it's now on my wall permanently <laughs> or with tape at least. And it said that love is not a battle to be won. What I understand from that is anything that we are seeing with us, anything that we choose, that we desire deeply, right? And let's say it's a loving relationship that we're looking to cultivate, pick any desire. When we choose it, and approach it as a fight we've already lost what the divine mother does is she attracts through her love through her compassion through being the essence of who she is so for me when i struggle it's like this paradox can kind of seem like it lives inside of that, right? Well, then do you not stand up for certain things? Speaking about rape, you know, reporting sexual assault, it's the intention from which it is given. So approaching it as I am doing this for the healing and highest benefit of all involved. That is why I approach it. I'm not creating an enemy. I'm not trying to punish this person for what they've done to me. I am simply trying to heal something that exists in this world that means that all of us are in pain. For me, love is not a battle to be won is probably one of my most sacred lessons. And um, and also having a moment of sacred pause, that's, 
that's the next big thing that's really in my field right now especially when my little girl gets activated or when I'm crying uncontrollably because I am very emotional and proud of it (laughs) (laughs) or I can I can feel like it's it's a gift right because from that place I can also create deep art and bring it out mm-hmm. into the world. And then I can soar to incredible heights. I, my roller coaster and spectrum of emotions is, is wide and extensive. But when I am either on one side or another, to take this moment and pause and connect and come back to self, she teaches me that. Mm. That's beautiful. When you were talking about the dips, I saw this massive roller coaster. And it's like, if you want that high and that rush, right, you got to go way down low. Like you can't, you can't (laughs) not, you can't have one and not the other. Right. Thank you so much for for being here and talking about the the mother and the feminine and the moon and the earth and all of the things. I would love for you to share how our listeners can connect with you. And I have to shout out your beautiful, gorgeous seed rosaries please tell us more about them because we well you got one for eric got one for his mother and you know for people who maybe the rosary doesn't resonate i use a mala and they're the the same thing right like a mala rosary you can use them for chanting prayer uh, kinesthetic i mean so many reasons and so i just had to plug that so you didn't forget to mention it but how can people connect with you all of the fun juicy things Oh, you're super sweet. Thank you so much. So um, Instagram, social media is probably the best as like a first starter. So my Instagram is Alejandra L. Valenzuela. Um, That's my handle. And my link tree is there. So you will see um, a link to my Etsy shop where I do sell these blessed rosaries. And I mean, there's a whole story around this, the seeds, you know, malas, I love malas, it just because I have a rosary doesn't mean I'm not going to put on a mala. And a rosary is mala beads. Mm -hmm. In, um, in antiquity, when you think about the first rosaries that were ever created, they came from flowers. And when deep when there, there would be a deity, and they would adorn the deity with a necklace of flowers, from there birthed the idea to carry malas and rosaries so that we could keep it as our own piece of jewelry that was more lasting than a flower. And I heard this wonderful podcast one time, and this woman was speaking about what we feel. You had mentioned kinesthetics about just holding a bead in your fingers. And what she told the listeners was that when you hold a bead like this, with your two fingers and you kind of just, it's so soothing, right? And we don't really know why. And she said, it's because when a baby is born, one of the first things it does, it's, you know, it'll, it'll pick up its finger and put it to the mother's breast, the nipple asking for milk. And so when you're connecting like this in prayer, you're reaching for that divine mother and you're connecting with her getting that spiritual nourishment i mean it's like seriously it's the greatest thing ever you can walk around with a prayer bead so these ones are infused with guadalupe's energy the job's tears come from medjugorje from bosnia um, a famous site in europe where the virgin mary appeared and then i sourced the beads from europe and they are shipped over to the americas because guadalupe is from the americas from mexico that was her or her apparition I'm Mexican. I make them here. And to me, what that represents is her energy. This is this is the conquest. This is old earth and the new earth, old world and the new world coming together in her love to heal. And some people, I mean, quite literally, when they open up the gift, they can feel like Guadalupe's love. It like pops out and they have this Guadalupe moment. And I just love them. I, they're my devotion to her and I just send these out into the world. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for creating that art. I actually texted my mother-in-law telling her we were interviewing you because she has one of your rosaries and she said, oh, "Oh, she's so talented. Good luck. But thank you for creating that beautiful art, a sacred, blessed Job's Tears seed rosary. They're just absolutely beautiful. I wish our viewers could see them. So I will link your Instagram in our show notes and they can go find your link tree and find all of the fun things 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. We love you. We love what you're doing and just how much you love the mother, love the feminine. We just, we need that right now. We need that motherly love. We need that feminine. We all as a collective need to just be held and hold each other. And the more that we amplify and send that out into the airwaves, the faster and easier we can get to where we're going. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. It love really is a dance, you know, and approaching it in that way, approaching it in how you would see somebody from across the room that you want to dance with, that you want to attract, right, with love versus something to be conquered or a battle to be won, like you said. The dynamic of relationships, how we relate to the earth, how we relate to our families, would all change if we would just approach it from a place of love and attraction versus conquest and battle. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you both for having me on here. It's been an absolute pleasure. I send you blessings to everything you're creating in the world. May your deepest heart's desires come true. May it always be so. Sending all of that right back to you and to all of our listeners. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening to this message, this transmission, and start cultivating some more divine mother, divine feminine. Work with the moon, work with the earth, whatever resonates for you. Do something, both men and women, right? Masculine and feminine, to start to cultivate that feminine energy because it will radically transform your life. <laughs>